Well, we're pleased to have as our guest today Larry Pinckney. Now, as you've seen Larry Pinckney probably many times on InfoWars, you know that he's had a lot of experience with racial division, how the government uses that in COINTELPRO, as well as he's got experience with guns and self-defense. And so we want to talk to Larry and get his opinion on what's going on with the Trayvon Martin case. Welcome, Larry. Thank you for coming Thank back. Thank you. It's great Thank to talk you. to you. It's, it's always a pleasure. I really mean that, as you well know. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. So let's rock and roll. Where do we go? Well, you were on the show Friday before the verdict came out with uh, mm -hmm. the Zimmerman uh, Trayvon Martin trial. And mm -hmm. uh, then the verdict was released on Saturday, finding Zimmerman not guilty. And mm -hmm. since then, we've had some uh, riots in various places. I guess the biggest incident that I know of is in L.A., where they were blocking the uh, traffic on the interstate, and the police basically stood down as uh, they stopped traffic. So what's your take on all of this and on people's well, reaction to it? I, I, I think, first of all, I want to give a lot of praise to uh, the overwhelming majority of black, white, brown, red, and yellow people, everyday ordinary people. I want to praise all of them, uh, so many, I should say, of them, for not succumbing to the trap that I really believe was being laid by the lamestream, corporate stream, media, and the corporate-owned government. Because what they wanted <laughs> to see was they wanted to see people out there uh, just, just without thinking, just doing and saying, but mostly doing things without thinking. They wanted to see hysteria. They wanted mm -hmm. to see division. And overall, I have to give my congratulations and my praise to everyday people because overall, they failed in doing that, with the exception of some places like you just mentioned, L.A. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when I look at this, and, and I was thinking about possible reactions, thinking back to the L.A. riots in the wake of the Rodney King beating and trial and that sort of thing. And, you know, it was so strange because my reaction to that, when I saw that, I was absolutely outraged at the police brutality. Absolutely mm -hmm. outraged. But I was outraged at the police. I didn't understand mm -hmm. why they would just pull people, you know, just the general public out of their cars and start beating them. You know, and, right. and it's interestingly enough, the police withdrew in that case as well and circled the wagons. You know, that was, uh, you know, Gates was the first one, the police chief there, to have SWAT teams and to militarize the police. And they took all of that firepower and basically circled the wagons around their own police departments. I guess they were expecting to get attacked, but instead of them getting attacked, they were attacking just general people off the streets, even uh, Korean grocers, you know, who didn't right. have anything, any dog in that fight. So that, right. I guess that's my concern, is that the government is always trying to set up this black-white division, when mm -hmm. really what we're seeing here is a blue versus the public. You know, it's the police and the brutality. Why aren't they concerned about that? Because it serves their purpose not to be concerned about that. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's always important to, in, in terms of manipulating people, the way they manipulate us is to inflame our passions, not our minds, but our passion. <laughs> yes. So we don't think. And, you know, our emotions, as it were. Um, and as, as I said earlier, I think that uh, overwhelmingly, the people, the everyday, ordinary, black, white, brown, red, and yellow people have shown not only a great deal of restraint, but a great deal of wisdom. So that tells me that people are waking up. They didn't go for the ghost in the massive way that the corporate stream media and no doubt the government, uh, Barack Obama, drone man, Phyllis man, and his minions would have liked to have seen. Right, absolutely. You know, one of the things that... Uh Alex was talking about on the radio, Alex Jones was talking about the statistics going back to the 70s, talking about how much, how this is really not, they're, they're trying to make a big deal out of a white on black issue here, and yet there's been a lot of black on black crime that 94% of the people in the large number of blacks have been shot in the last 30 to 40 years, 94% of that was black shooting black, but you know, interestingly enough, the other part of the statistic is that as a district attorney in Chicago, where there is a lot of that type of crime going on, pointed out that 80% of the deaths there were due to drug prohibition. So if we take a look at this war on drugs, you could say that 75% of the black people who have been shot 
were shot mm -hmm. by other black people because of this prohibition that's going on, this prohibition mm -hmm. that works in the interest. Why don't the people take to the streets and talk about that? Why don't they protest the war on drugs? Because we've got more people in prison than China or Russia or anybody has ever had. And the majority of those people in prison are black people. Why aren't they upset right. about that? I mean, they're, that's what you want to see racism. Take a look at the war on drugs. Look at what Nixon and Reagan did with the war on drugs. Why don't they protest that? Why don't they stop that? Because if they were to do that, if they were to <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> this is not funny, but I, I have to have a sense of humor. Because if they were to do that, then that would mean that people were actually beginning to pay attention to who the real enemy is. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. And obviously, <laughs> they do not want folks, I don't care what their color, they don't want folks to pay attention to the, the national and global power elite, the corporate media, corporate media, uh, the corporations, the corporate governments, because, oh my God, then we'll come together, unite uh, around our common interest. So, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, when, when, when I think about when I think about uh, the horrors that go on in poor communities across the board, not just black communities, but poor communities, economically poor, I'm talking. Mm -hmm. But in in black in black communities, where you know, I remember a couple of years ago, David. I think it was two or two or two or three years ago. I I came across this poster, and the poster said that. Uh, Blacks kill more blacks than the KKK, all right? And then it was signed, good job, keep it up, KKK. Yeah, yeah, right. Now, right. You know, now, now I'm saying, wait a minute. Now, people wanted to get offended about the KKK part. Okay, but let's also look at the situation. I understand that economic, educational, social, cultural deprivation, all those things are real. However... That is not uh, a, a good enough argument to simply ignore the, 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 the terrible pain that, and, and deaths and murders and violence, quote unquote, that's going on uh, in, in black communities and other poor communities. So my emphasis is, see, I don't, I don't, my horse in the race, if you will, to use your expression, David, um, my, my horse is the people. I, right. I think we... We need to really understand that this is about the people coming together. And they're going to do everything they can. You know, like Trayvon Martin. And I feel great sorrow and pain, of course, for any life that's lost, including, of course, uh, this, 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 this young man, Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. Now, at, at the same time, I also feel great sorrow for the other lives that are being lost every yes. single day yes. across this country, but you don't hear anything about. Now, why is that we don't hear anything about that? You know, it's and, hardly, and, and you never hear the national mainstream media talk about the deaths due to police brutality, due to beatings, due to shootings, people dying from being tasered, people getting crippled from being tasered. That's going right. on all the time, and it's right. going on to black and to white, and mm -hmm. yet there is no uh, outrage about that. I mean, yes, this is one person's death, but look at how many of these other cases there are. Nobody is talking about that. Right, and as you said, David, it crosses the board. Mm -hmm. This is happening to people of all colors, especially uh, black, uh, white, and brown people, and but it includes, you know, red and yellow people too, That's okay? Right. But if we recognize that, if we realize that, if the people become conscious of that, once again, they're going to stop, they're going to critically think. Don't, we don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what's going on. So we have got to be, when I say we, I mean we the people, we've got to be the ones to determine the narrative. That's We've right. got to be the one to determine the narrative. Not the corporate stream media, not the government, you know, not these hate mongers out there who, who want to see division. They want to see blood in the streets, when in fact, it should be unity in the streets. I want to praise those few people too that, uh, the, 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 who were outraged, but who did not allow themselves to be pumped out to be played and pushed into reacting in such a way so that they could call out the SWAT team so that they could uh, uh, do what they really, what we know they really want to do. Right. But back to, right. 
right. you know, back back to what you had <laughs> said, and I apologize for digressing, but the, the, the fact is, is that we, that's to say, everyday, ordinary, black, white, brown, red, and yellow people, everyday, ordinary folks need to pursue our interests, our common interests collectively, together. That's right. You know, and, and that's when I am determined to keep pushing that message, determined, you know, so, so mm -hmm. I, 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 get, I hope I'm making some semblance of sense here. Oh, absolutely. You know, going back to the war on drugs, I mean, when this really mm -hmm. started ramping up under Reagan, I became aware of these asset forfeiture laws, how they were charging inanimate objects with crimes and the way they were doing these no-knock raids, which now have become just ordinary, everyday things. They're not right. even an aberration anymore. And right. they report them, and a local news might report them once, and then that's it. Everybody forgets about it. We try mm -hmm. to pull these things up and report on them on a national basis, but it's become so commonplace, nobody is even thinking about what's essentially martial law anymore, that they mm -hmm. just feel like they just, they're going to kick the door down, use stun grenades and, and uh, you know, throw grenades in and, and uh, bark orders at people. If you don't do exactly what uh, they want, they shoot you. If you think you've got an intruder, they shoot you. This is uh, people of all races now are being affected right. by this. And it was affecting everybody's, they, they were using the war on drugs to destroy our constitutionally recognized, God-given civil liberties. And a lot of people who didn't, weren't a part of either selling drugs or using drugs just said, well, I don't really care. That doesn't really affect me. They didn't realize that it affected them. Now we're seeing the same thing being put on steroids with the war on terror. Because now exactly. they're really ramping up the uh, militarization of the police. They're really going around and doing this. People need to wake up about this. But let's talk about how they're, they're using and controlling this narrative with the media as well as the government. I mean, it started right away with NBC uh, editing the tape, editing the 9-11 tape, to try to make it look like it's more racially motivated than I believe it really was. And that was really the seminal event. And it looks like the defense attorneys now are going to take action against NBC, civil action against that, because that was really the thing that, that kicked, started it, isn't it? Yes, yes. And, and, and this is what the corporate stream media does anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, all they want to do is to, one, they want to make money. So all they can get people to play, pay attention to uh, their machinations, if you will, their shenanigans, okay, rather than reporting, uh, seriously reporting the fact that we have no privacy uh, yes. in, in, the, in this country. They wouldn't dare go into that. They right. want to talk to us about, you know, where is Edward Snowden instead of what the information is that Edward Snowden put out. They yes. don't want to deal with that. Exactly. Okay? And it's the same thing here. You know, they they always, I say, they I'm talking about this blasted corporate stream media, which is really nothing more than a propaganda arm for the corporate control, corporate owned government. So, uh, you know, the war, so called war on terror is actually a war of terror Absolutely. against everyday people. It's not a war, uh, you know, against terror. It's a war of terror, and that war of terror is being waged in so many different ways on so many different levels, both physically and psychologically. Mm -hmm. It is being waged against us, yes. we the people. Yes. They're terrorizing the public, hoping that the public will think that they can be secure by giving up their liberties, but the opposite... Of being of liberty is not security; it's slavery. They're right. trying to enslave us, and they're using the tactic of terrorism against us to do that. Now, talking about the way they manipulate the media, I mean, the first thing they did was NBC goes in and edits this tape, and the police at the scene had seen that his head was beaten, and they believed that it was a self-defense thing. The police chief didn't believe that there was a case there, and but they spun that to try to make it racially motivated. And they actually sent down, and this is interesting because this was found by Judicial Watch. They filed a Freedom of Information Act in April and, uh, of 2012, and they got this information back that the Department of Justice actually sent down a group called a Community Relations Service, and it says that they deployed them in the memos, and they paid them uh, to do uh, one event after the other. They've got uh, events like uh, on a timeline here, March 25th through 27th. They go down, they're deployed, quote-unquote, to San, uh, Sanford, Florida, to work marches, demonstrations, and rallies related to shooting and death. Then a couple of days later, they're, they're uh, 
give them like another thousand dollars to provide support for protest deployment in Florida. Then they give them another seven hundred fifty dollars to provide technical assistance to the city of Sanford and law enforcement agencies for the march and rally. So they're going through. There's this long timeline where the Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice, is actually sending down an organization and funding it to basically create civil disrest is mm -hmm. what they're doing at that point. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. later mm -hmm. on, yeah, I mean, it's, you've seen this type of thing when you were with the original Black Panthers, right? Over and over again. Mm -hmm. Look, all they've done today, and I say today, in the year 2013, in this 21st century, all they've done is ratcheted it up. They've tweaked it, okay? Mm -hmm. And they've, they've begun to, I mean, let me, let me just deal with this head on, if I may. Let's assume, now I don't know this, none of us really know, but let's assume that the matter was indeed a quote-unquote racial matter. Okay, mm -hmm. let, let's assume that. So if it was indeed, why is it that the corporate stream media is in fact heightening this to a point of hysteria instead of saying, hey, this is a grand opportunity, even out of tragedy, even out of sadness, this is a grand opportunity for us to come together to discuss our concerns, to deal with this, instead of, you know, ratcheting up the hysteria. Right. Even if it were. I don't know that it was. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But even if it were a racial, quote-unquote, matter, all of us, whether we like it or not, belong to one race, and that race is called Human, H-U-M-A-N. That's right. And we, we've got to right. start thinking and acting in those terms with that mindset. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, they pick a skin color. You know, why mm -hmm. they pick hair, hair color and, and, you know, pit the redheads against the blondes or something? I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But you had experience with this, with the Black Panthers. It, it, yeah. it spread out they, beyond just being a black group, right? You got people from all different uh, ethnic backgrounds or cultures right. involved in that, didn't you? Right. And and what we learned, uh, and I might say the hard way, uh, <laughs> because in those years, in the 60s and 70s, we had no idea of how vicious, how insidious we had no that this government is. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's far worse today. Oh, yeah. Bad enough then. Okay. But the, it was all about even <clears throat> then using agent provocateurs, divide and conquer, uh, uh, discrediting people with false information, all of which they still do today, but on a much, much larger scale. Mm -hmm. The Black Panther Party that was formed in October of 1966, the original Black Panther Party, uh, was ultimately physically decimated, destroyed, not our legacy, but physically the party was destroyed as a result of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program, and these tactics. But it wasn't just us. It happened to white political activists. Yeah. It happened to American Indian, that's the American Indian movement, Native, Indigenous people, political activists. Mm -hmm. It happened to Chicano, Chicana, you know, La Raza Unida, uh, uh, the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, the Puerto Ricans. I mean, it happened across the board. Right. And I go back to my original point. So what they're doing, by they, I mean the corporate government, they continue to use the same old tactics. Why? Because they work. But yes. I, will, I will say this, the more of us that become conscious, David, the more of us that become conscious, the less those tactics will work. Well, you know, that's exactly what they're doing. You're talking about how they send down agent provocateurs, they use it to divide and conquer, and that's exactly what the Department of Justice did with this community relations service organization that they deployed down to Sanford. You know, they got the police chief temporarily fired. Uh, he was originally, eventually reinstated. They got the prosecution going. And then look at what they did in the prosecution. We just learned right after they did the uh, verdict of not guilty, they fired the IT manager from the Attorney General's office because he had gone public with the fact that they were manipulating evidence there. Uh, they had images that would have been uh, in the favor of the defense department because, you know, they're showing Trayvon, all the pictures that they show of Trayvon is when he's about 12 years old or whatever. They want to make him look as innocent and non-threatening as possible. So there were pictures of him with guns and stuff like, you know, looking, looking like a tough guy, which would have helped the defense. 
but they withheld that evidence. Now, what happened was this uh, IT manager, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, it's Ben Kruid Boss, I think is the way you pronounce his name. He was director of IT. He happened to notice that although they had sent uh, 2,958 photos, there were actually 4,275. So they had <laughs> withheld thousands of photos that might have been incriminating, might have been helpful for the defense. Now, that's a criminal action on the part of the prosecutor in, to withhold that. In and that. of itself. That's yeah, right. In exactly. and of itself. Now, that's a criminal action. Now, listen to what happened, Larry. Okay, so the attorney generals, after they, first of all, they, they suspended him May 18th, and they fired him on Saturday. And what they did was they, they accused him of erasing the data to try to cover it for themselves and said, that's why we're firing him, because he erased the data. However, what we find is that the defense team said that they noticed that some of the pictures that they got were cell phone pictures that were black and white. And they said, wait a minute, cell phones don't take black and white pictures. And so they knew that something was being doctored because the, why would they be black and white? Well, because they didn't want to show any blood on Zimmerman's head. So they mm -hmm. filed some requests for the original pictures and they said it took them from the end of January until June 4th to get very poor pastel colored pictures, not still the, the full color pictures. So obviously this is being manipulated and being controlled by the Attorney General's office being manipulated and controlled by the federal government, being manipulated and controlled by the media, so that, as mm -hmm. you said, just as they did with the original Black Panthers, once they, and that's when the, the Black Panthers got dangerous, was when they branched out from just being about the black community to where they started right. pulling in people from all different communities. That's when right. they got dangerous. That's when they set them up with this COINTEL Pro, sending in false information, divide and conquer, and uh, these, these COINTEL Pro agents. And that's what we see going on here, even in this uh, Zimmerman case. People need to understand how they're being played because the government, as you said, still using the same playbook, but they've mm -hmm. gotten a lot more sophisticated at it. They are. You know, I was reading uh, a statement uh, that is purported to have been made uh, by Ben Jealous, the head of the NAACP. Uh, I call it the National Association for Corporate, anyway, it, not, <laughs> the NAACP. All right. Um, and Jealous said, now this man should know better, but he said, quote, that Zimmerman uh, had been found innocent. Zimmerman was not found innocent. That's right. All right? George right. Zimmerman was found not guilty. It's yes. a big difference. Yes. Okay? But right. the media is not making that distinction. Mm -hmm. And in our system of law, in the U U.S., I won't say our anymore, it's really theirs, but in the U.S. system of jurisprudence, or so-called the justice system, I call it the just us injustice system, just us <laughs> everyday folks, injustice, but in this system, it's an adversarial system. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not a system about bringing about uh, truth. It has nothing to do with truth. It has nothing to do with justice. I don't care what your color is. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's nothing to do with that. But, you know, by, by planting these seeds, by the corporate stream media not making these important distinctions, and by the government uh, engaging in these kinds of nefarious uh, uh, activities to to corrupt the evidence. And I don't care whether the evidence is for the defense or whether it's for the prosecution. Remember, this is an adversarial system. That's what this quote-unquote system of jurisprudence is about. So if it's that, it has little to do with really attaining justice. Now, the, what you just mentioned, David, with respect to uh, the the government uh, engaging in, in making sure in this specific case that photos were not received. Look, that's what they did time and time and time and time again. Uh, uh, that's why we have so many political prisoners in, in the U.S. Yes, oh, I yeah. said political prisoners. Absolutely. Because it was fabricated. You can fabricate evidence by withholding evidence, mm -hmm. because if you withhold certain evidence, what you're doing is you're making sure that either the defense or the prosecution is unable to present a strong case. Well, look at, right? look at when you sign in as a witness. They ask that you have to swear that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? So what mm -hmm. they're doing, when they're withholding evidence, you're not getting the whole truth. Well, of course it. not. 
Of course mm-hmm. not. And it's it's not about truth. Right. It's not about justice. And this is I want to say to uh, the listening audience, all my brothers and sisters, all my sisters and brothers, all colors, <laughs> don't go for the ghost. Don't get sucked into this 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 toilet of of believing this 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 hysteria and this nonsense because we're being manipulated. Don't be manipulated. Kudos to you who are, have not been manipulated. Reach out to your other sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, and tell them to use their mind, as the uh, Chicano Chicanos would say, use your cabeza, use your head, and, right. and don't be misled. You know, in this case, this is a good example of the importance of a jury trial. Because in most cases, the prosecution comes up with a lot of trumped up charges just to hope that you'll plea bargain down to what they want to convict you for in the first place anyway. Right. Now, here you've got a situation where even though the judge appeared to be trying to skew things as well, you've got the jury actually finding him, as you pointed out, not innocent, but not guilty. Because mm-hmm. in our system, you have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt what you're trying to charge them with. And what they're saying is the government didn't prove that. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's very difficult. And taking the specifics of the case, for example, I mean, even if there is a racial component in why he was following Trayvon around, it's almost like when you've got a situation with a husband and wife, and the wife is being passive aggressive and nagging and taunting the husband, and finally he loses it and gets violent and starts attacking her. If she's in danger of her life, she is entitled to use deadly force to stop that attack. And so if you've got a situation here where whatever led up to it, at that point, it's kind of like uh, somebody breaks into your house and uh, they, they start to, you know, you, you might fire a warning shot or whatever, they turn and run. If they're on your front yard running away from you and you shoot them in the back, you've used unwarranted force. Well, you also have a right to defend yourself if they're coming at you for whatever reason. And so that's really kind of the difficult thing that the jury had to decide was what was going on at that moment. And I think based on the uh, physical evidence that the police saw at the scene, I think that's why they originally didn't charge him that way and felt that there really wasn't a case because there was a lot of evidence that it was a pretty brutal, violent fight. Uh, And talking about that, we had a caller who called in to Alex Jones on the radio show on Friday. And one of the things he was saying was open carry. You know, in Florida, they're not allowed to have open carry. In Florida, you can only legally open carry a loaded firearm while engaged in or going to and from fishing, hunting, and camping. Now, this law is currently being uh, pro- uh, uh, challenged in the uh, court there in Florida. But mm-hmm. what do you think? I mean, you know, uh, uh, the Black Panthers openly carried weapons. Uh, what do you think about open carry versus concealed carry? I mean, it, it seems to me like uh, open carry is a deterrent, actually, to violence. Well, quite frankly, I'd rather know what I'm dealing with than not know. Exactly, okay? exactly. It, it seems to me that that's common sense. If somebody's carrying a 357 Magnum or a 32 or a 38 and I don't know it, I mm-hmm. might accidentally step on their foot and get blown away. That's right? right, that's right. And and so uh, I, I think it's just a matter of common sense. Uh, I, I think it goes the heart. Let's go through the heart of this matter. The government... And in this case, Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Attorney General's office, as well as right down from drone man Barack Obama, right on down from the White House, the government is doing everything it can to not only disarm people uh, physically, but first they want to disarm us mentally, psychologically, so that we go for the okie doke. Okay, right. I believe that we have a constitution, albeit that drone man and, and his Democratic and Republican Party minions uh, have done everything they can to gut it, albeit, notwithstanding that fact, we, we supposedly have a Constitution, we have a First Amendment, we have a Fourth Amendment, and supposedly, you know, if, if we're supposed to be able to exercise the rights that are enshrined in that, clearly, the propaganda that's being used to keep people in fear, to keep people... Uh, uh, in a state of hysteria is being used not for our benefit, meaning everyday, ordinary, black, white, brown, red, and yellow people, but it's being used for the benefit of those who want to control and manipulate us. Same old thing, only they brush it up. And, and we have to bear that in mind. So I go right to the heart of the matter. They want to disarm uh, everyday people in every sense of the word, not just yeah. with the right self-defense. But and, in every sense. 
And if we look at the open carry versus concealed carry, I mean, you look at a situation where, as you said, you want to know what somebody is carrying. If you see a guy over there and he's, and he's got a gun strapped on his hip or across his shoulder, uh, as Robert Heinlein said in his science fiction uh, uh, novel, he said, an armed society is a polite society. You know, like you said, you don't want to step on his toe. So mm -hmm. in that situation, open carry can actually be a deterrence to violence. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when the government comes in, as they do here, we've got some very liberal gun control laws here in, in Texas. And by liberal, I mean in the original sense of the word, free, you right, know, right. Uh, in the good yeah. sense, right? I know. And, and yeah. so, you know, it, it, we have pretty liberal laws in Texas, and yet they don't allow open carry. They make you, and this is the, the problem, you go to concealed carry, now you've got to get registered with the government for concealed carry. Now, the original reason why you would have to get registered with the government for concealed carry was back in the day, people realized that, hey, if you're hiding a gun, maybe there, you've got something else to hide. So we want to know a little bit more about you, right? Otherwise, you're free to carry openly. That's the way it used to be all over the United States. But they use this concealed carry because why? It sets up legal entrapments for the people who, first of all, it registers the person who's carrying concealed. Then it sets up all kinds of legal entrapments for them. And then it also fails to provide the kind of deterrence within society that a firearm really should be to violence. You know, it really should be a deterrent to violence. So, uh, you know, it, it seems to me like that's another example. And we're seeing this now with Obama using this case to attack the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. right. Even e e even as he attacks and blows people away in Libya, North Africa, right. Somalia, East right. Africa, you know, I, Afghanistan, Yemen, right. Bahrain, on and on. Yeah, oh, I yeah. mean, I'm just really trying to show up the hypocrisy of it all. Okay? Every, every day people are being killed. I, I think it was a half dozen or more people killed in Pakistan today from an Obama drone strike. And mm -hmm. they, they trumpet that as if that's a mm -hmm. great deal. Right, right. Then they turn around, David, at the same time and say, I, I just really don't understand why our society is so violent. Yeah, they absolutely. can't get violent. They're the ones, all they're doing is they're pushing it. They're pushing it. They're, they're you know, this whole macho man, get off my planet by sundown mentality. And That's then, so they, then they, they, they turn around and act like they don't understand why people do what they do when, in fact, they're programming people to do those things and then trying to use those actions as a way to disarm the people. Absolutely. Well, Larry, wrap it up for us and tell us what you would like the general public to uh, make out of this. And, and uh, again, restate the, you know, what we are talking about earlier, I guess. Uh, people to look beyond what the media is feeding them, what the government, how the government is trying to manipulate them. Well, I want to say first and foremost, again, to you, David, to InfoWars, to the entire, uh, all, all, all the hardworking sisters and brothers there, I want to say thank you very, very much uh, from, from Alex on down or on, however you want to say it. Now, to answer your, your question, I, I, I think that it's important for all of us, all of us, to regain our sanity. In order to regain our humanity, we have to first regain our sanity. And what do I mean? What I mean is don't uh, react. If we're going to do something, there's a big difference between responding and reacting. Do not react, okay? Mm -hmm. And my sisters and brothers, my brothers and sisters, black, white, brown, red, and yellow, don't react. Think, critically think, use your mind, okay? And, and uh, you, you know, I have great faith with ups and downs, notwithstanding ups and downs and all the challenges we face. I still have great faith in the ability of humans uh, to evolve, to grow. We have got to push aside this corporate stream media nonsense. We have to be, as you all are doing right there at InfoWars, we have to be our own media our own media, okay? And, and as I, in my columns in blackcommentator.com and intrepidreport.com, I always end the column by saying, each one, reach one, each one, teach one. I'm within my sisters and brothers. That's what we have to do. We, it's a, it's a struggle. It's hard. They're going to do everything they can to discredit us, to, to knock us down. 
But as Frank Sinatra would say, I get right back up. You know, <laughs> remember that that rubber tree ant? Okay, I'm gonna get right back up. So uh, I want to send out my love and my strength to all my sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters of all colors, of all ethnicities, and I want to say all power to the people, just as we said back in the day. Great. Thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate you giving us that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Well, as Larry was saying, each one reach one, each one teach one, and that's exactly what you can do at prisonplanet.tv. Get a subscription there. You can reach out and teach other people. Ten people can share that subscription with you and see the news as we're putting it out there, a different kind of news, a news that's not controlled by a centrally programmed uh, government or media, as well as understand how they are trying to control your mind. And this week we have State of Mind is being released. It's uh, still pre-bookable from uh, InfoWarsStore.com. And uh, this documentary here will help you and others understand exactly how the government is trying to control you, the techniques they use, and it's much broader than even just COINTELPRO. It's much broader than MKUltra. It extends fundamentally to the media as well as the educational system. So take a look at that. Uh, get state of mind. It'll be a real eye-opener for you and for your friends. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. <laughs>